Hello, I'm Dr Ed Sutherland and I'm a lecturer in Cognitive Psychology here at the University of Leeds. When I took my psychology degree over 20 years ago, I spent some time studying the nature of logic and how well, or not, humans apply the rules of logic when they engage in their day-to-day -day reasoning activity. I found it one of the most interesting areas of study that I covered as part of my studies and I went on to complete my PhD research in this area. I continue to have more than a passing interest in it today. Some of the ideas and concepts in logic are difficult to grasp at first, but if you persevere, I think that you too will find it one of the more interesting areas of psychological study. After all, what could be more interesting to psychologists than trying to think about the way in which we think? In this podcast, I will cover a number of issues of importance in the study of logical reasoning. Much of this is purely related to the nature of logic as it is important to understand this first. I will then turn attention to what research in reasoning has to tell us about the nature of human logic. Initially we will consider what type of reasoning we are dealing with and we will focus primarily on deductive reasoning. I will explain why some conclusions are valid and others invalid. Then I will summarize research that has tried to explain and examine how well people reason. Finally, I will consider one theoretical approach that has attempted to explain the pattern of performance that we will have seen. Logic is often thought of as a rather abstract, cold and unhuman activity, but there are many times in everyday activity that we engage in reasoning of some form or another. Johnson, Laird and Byrne, in their seminal 1991 book, Deduction, outlined a number of ways in which logic was important in human activities. They argued that logic is central to common activities such as formulating plans, determining the consequences of hypotheses, interpreting and formulating instructions, and to pursue arguments and negotiations. I can tell you from personal experience that a PhD in logic means that you tend to win quite a lot of arguments and I rather suspect that my first wife would agree. From what Johnson, Laird and Byrne have suggested it seems clear that logic and reasoning are central to the sorts of things that we do every day while going about our lives and yet on the whole we remain unaware that we are engaging in this activity of reasoning. The first thing to consider at this stage is to define what we mean by the term reasoning. As I mentioned earlier, we will focus on deduction in this podcast. There are numerous forms of thinking and in his 1998 book, The Computer and the Mind, Johnson Laird attempted to produce a taxonomy or classification of the different types of thinking and covered different forms of mental activity such as creative thinking, daydreaming and reasoning. He drew a distinction between two types of reasoning, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning, and it is important that we understand why these two forms of reasoning are different. As we will not focus on induction here, I will consider this first and then show how deductive reasoning is different. In his taxonomy of thinking, Johnson Laird stated that the defining characteristic of induction, the thing that makes it different from deduction, is that induction results in an increase in what he called semantic information. While this is the difference between the two types of thinking, it might help if we consider an example here to illustrate what an increase in semantic information is. Let us consider the following two premises or statements. Number one, the burglary was committed between 8 and 8.30. And secondly, that Adam was seen running from the building at 8.15. Given these two statements, we may conclude, using induction, that Adam was involved in the crime in some way. However, this conclusion is not necessarily the case. This is the crucial point here. The conclusion that Adam was involved in the crime does not necessarily follow from these premises. It may be true, it may even be likely or probable, but it does not necessarily follow. Part of the process here is that we have added our knowledge of how burglaries happen. 
that someone needs to be in the burgled building at the time that the crime takes place and that burglars tend to leave the premises in haste once the act is complete. Thus what induction yields are conclusions that are likely or plausible rather than necessary. The importance of this idea of necessity should become more apparent as we look at deduction and the conclusions that we can draw through this process. The important point here is that deduction results in conclusions that are necessarily true and follow from the premises. The process of deduction is what we call truth preserving. This means that if the premises or the initial statements are true, then the conclusions that we draw must also be true. We can therefore state that the process of deduction is truth preserving. True premises always lead to two true conclusions if we follow a valid deductive argument. The process of deduction does not require the addition of any other knowledge about how the world works or how burglaries take place. It is based solely on the information that we are given in the premises. What we are doing here is making explicit information that was previously implicit. Let us consider another example here to help clarify what this notion of truth preserving means. Consider the following two premises or statements. Number one, all artists are beekeepers. And number two, all beekeepers are chemists. We can conclude then that all artists are chemists. This is a valid deductive argument form according to the rules of logic which means that it is truth preserving. Consequently, if the two premises about the relationships between artists, beekeepers and chemists are true, then the conclusion that all artists are chemists must also be true. This point brings us to another important distinction, the difference between truth and validity. While these two concepts may be related, they are not the same thing and a grasp of how they are different is important in being able to understand the nature of logic. Let us consider the following well-worn example. Number one, all men are mortal. Number two, Socrates is a man. Therefore, Socrates is mortal. I'm assuming that you're all happy to accept this conclusion. It is true and it follows a valid argument form. That is, that the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. Given that the premises are true, then the conclusion must also be true. So what we have here is a true, valid conclusion. Now consider this next example. Number one, all dogs have tails. Number two, the president of the US is a dog. Therefore, the president of the US has a tail. Now as far as we know, and I have no reason to believe otherwise, the President of the United States does not have a tail, and if he does, then he keeps it very well hidden. However, the argument itself, that is, the relationship between the statements, is valid. It follows exactly the same argument structure as the example about Socrates and mortality, and we know that this argument form is valid. So what we have here is a conclusion that is valid but untrue. Hence, while we are concerned with truth and validity in the study of logic, the two are related but clearly distinct. Now that we have an understanding of the nature of deduction and what it means to say that something is or is not valid, then we can start to understand whether people reason according to the rules of logic or not. That is, do participants in experiments on logical reasoning show reasoning that follows these valid argument forms or do they make errors when reasoning and deviate from logic? If we want to assess whether participants are able to reason effectively or not, we must understand which conclusions are valid and which are invalid so that we can categorise the conclusions that are drawn by our participants as to whether they are right or wrong. The notions that we will consider here are based on propositional reasoning, which is reasoning about the words that connect linguistic propositions or ideas together.
and specifically we will look at conditional reasoning. Propositions can be connected together by connectives such as not and or and of most importance to us here, if then. These if then type statements form the basis of conditional reasoning. That's reasoning about the word if as opposed to reasoning about the word or which we call disjunctive reasoning or reasoning about the word and which we call conjunctive reasoning. Let me explain about if more fully.